Well, thank you for having me here. I'm excited. I'm going to change the topic totally. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about um, something that's very dear to my heart. And I'm going to start with a story, and I'm going to end with a challenge. And so my story is when I was a resident in pediatrics um, in the late, I hate to say this, but 70s, um, we, were, we worked hard. We had lots of admissions to the hospital. And my saddest cases were children that came in who had uh, Haemophilus influenza type B infections. They came in with meningitis. They came in with sepsis. They were terribly sick. Half of them died. And those that survived had a lot of severe consequences because of their infection. They were just, it was terribly sad. And so as my career went on in the mid-80s, a vaccine came out. And it was effective in children who were over uh, four years of age. And it was very effective in preventing Haemophilus influenza type B. And then in the 1990s, a major scientific advance, that vaccine got conjugated to a protein. And now it was successfully used in babies. And so what happened? We don't see Haemophilus influenza type B disease anymore. It totally revolutionized infectious disease and kids who had to be hospitalized. It's a miracle. And I remember it because I saw these kids die. I had to take care of them. And so for me, vaccine, vaccines are very personal. And I want to talk today about two ways of thinking about making decisions about vaccination. One is science. The other is intuition. And I want to talk about how the debate between uh, looking and viewing those two different ways um, really is leading to a very dangerous trend. So what is science and the scientific method? I'm going to just here really briefly review this so you know what I'm talking about, basically. So the scientific method really is well established. Um, first, observations lead to hypotheses. And observations can be about anything. It was Newton with gravity. The, the apple always falls. It never goes up. That was an observation. It led to a hypothesis, something like a um, hypothesis that maybe there's something holding that apple or pulling that apple down. It's tested by experimentation. And that can be quite complex or it can be quite simple. The results are analyzed. And then conclusions are developed. And now, in our day and age, scientific method means those conclusions are submitted for publication so that everybody can learn from them. And before they're published, they have to undergo a very rigorous peer review, which means that people try to tear apart everything that's done with that scientific experiment, that hypothesis, to really, to really vet it to make sure it's valid. And so this scientific proof, by the time it actually gets published, has really gone through quite the process. And it relies on evidence and not faith. It really says, OK, even if I, maybe the hypothesis that you thought was going to happen, your experiments maybe said, no, they're not going to happen. So that it's not always what you believe, but your science and your experiments let you know that. Um, Part of the scientific method is that it's really important that these questions can actually be disproved. They call it the null hypothesis. Great kind of a question is, does, is God real? Well, you, you actually can't test that. So that's nothing that you really could undergo scientific scrutiny. So you have to be able to disprove it. And one of the real pitfalls, and it's just it is because of the way science happens, is that scientific inquiry does not lead to the ability to say something is absolutely true or false. And, and, and that ends up being uh, a difficulty because we don't know, it may be in our experience that this never happens, but that doesn't mean that to somebody else, in someplace else, at another time, it won't happen. So there is no always and there's no never in science. And that becomes a problem when you want to uh, pass policies, for instance, and be able to guarantee somebody that that policy might actually be a good one. So there are no absolutes in science. Can we say that the sky is absolutely going to fall or not fall? No, we can't see either one of them. But it's unlikely, based on evidence, that it's ever going to fall. Can we say that sugar is related to hyperactivity? No, we actually can't say that. But we can say the evidence to date, does not support that conclusion. Um, but, because maybe it does cause it in a really
really small uh, number of people. And so science really is about numbers and collecting data and looking to see proportions. Is it more likely or less likely? And can we say that vaccines are always safe or always effective? And the answer is no, we can't say that. Because it may be there's very rare adverse events that may occur if enough vaccine is given. And so we may not be personally aware of it, but it's something that might happen. So science doesn't really have absolutes. And it really makes it difficult when you're talking about vaccine and vaccine decisions to guarantee anything. So let's look at another way of making decisions and processing information. And that's intuition. And so intuition really is based on one's own experience. What happens to you? It's often quite logical in describing uh, cause and effect. It doesn't have to be illogical. It can be, okay, something bad happened. You noted right before that bad thing happened that maybe that person had eaten a food and then they got sick. Or maybe they touched an animal and they got bit. Or maybe something happened and then an event occurred. And so logically speaking, you might say, in my experience, when this happens, this happens. Maybe this causes this. And maybe in your experience, that's very valid and it's quite logical. Now for vaccines, intuition is beginning to play an increasing role in suggesting that childhood vaccines cause autism or result in neurological symptoms. And, and the intuition is, my child has autism, my child has a neurological condition, and they got vaccinated. Maybe it was in the recent past, maybe it was in the past, um, but in their mind, that logic exists. And so, so this really creates a problem when people want to make really good decisions for their children. The other really interesting thing about now is that we're connected. We're connected over the internet, um, things that happen on the other side of the world, we hear about immediately. And so this feeds intuition when stories that are similar stories get shared. And they say, well, that happened to me too. Or that happened to me too. And so you get a whole strategy. And now there are online chat rooms all about what happened because of immunizations. And it's, it's very legitimate. They share their stories. But it's not science. And it's not fact. So let's talk about vaccines and what has happened with vaccines. I think it's a remarkable story. As I said, for me, it was a miracle because it made it possible for children that I used to watch die. They don't do that anymore. They don't get those diseases. And so this is a graph that just talks about the different kinds of infections pre-vaccine and post-vaccine. And you can see in some cases 99% reductions in the number of uh, diseases. That's really a profound impact. And so in the United States, this is from the United States, you can see enormous reductions. In fact, like polio, 100% cases pre, zero cases in the United States. And so these vaccines have changed the entire pattern of infectious diseases in the United States. And now we have most parents, young parents, have never seen any of these infections. I saw them, but that's a long time ago. My medical students that I teach have never seen these infections. That's miraculous if you look at it on one side, but if you're that person who hasn't ever seen one, you might say, well, what's the risk? So if we look at the science versus intuition and vaccine choices, the scientific data on the incidence of vaccines, and this is, um, the evidence is actually from surveillance, so these are, these are factual reportings of all these diseases, really shows these significant decreases because of immunization. It's really, really clear. This happened, vaccine happened, this happened. It is the disease, it, it was scientifically proven that that's really what happened. But these vaccine, these diseases exist in other parts of the world. These are not eradicated. The only disease that has ever been eradicated infection is smallpox. That's the only one. And it was because of the immunizations. So these infections exist. They are not eradicated. Because many new parents have never seen this disease, and their intuition says, well, maybe they're really not a risk for my child. I've never seen this. I don't have, I've never heard about it. Nobody in my family or friends 
have ever seen this. Maybe I don't need to worry. And on the other side of things, popular media, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, suggests that these vaccines can have very serious side effects. So then how do we look at this? So I'm gonna go through disease risk, vaccine risk, the science, and then I'm gonna talk about intuition. Disease risk for, if we look at it scientifically, we are having pertussis outbreaks all around the country. In 2010, there were 10,000 cases of documented, which means there are far more undocumented, cases of pertussis in California resulting in 10 deaths all deaths were in infants less than four months of age. Pertussis is not particularly a dreadful disease for those who are not who are older, but for infants it's deadly. Measles, imported from other places, classic example, and outbreaks in San Diego and other parts of the country have resulted in a 30% risk of hospitalization for both children and adults. People forget how deadly measles is. They forget, because they've never seen it. Those are the facts. What is the vaccine risk? Well, mainly vaccine risk is in immunized, immunocompromised children who, and this is with live vaccines. They, don't, they may not tolerate live vaccines very well, so they don't actually get these vaccines. But we know that that's a risk. Allergic reactions are incredibly rare. I have never seen one in my entire career. But we know they exist. They've been reported. Multiple studies, and we're talking 20, 30, 40 studies that have done on, been done on hundreds of thousands of cases have shown no association of the pertussis or measles vaccines with either neurological conditions or autism. And these are compelling, highly scientific studies that led the institutes of medicine to simply say there is no cause and effect. There are no absolutes in science, however, so what we really have to say is this vaccine is rarely associated with serious, serious side effects. We can't say that there's not ever any. And so that makes it distrustful in some, in some folks' eyes. How come you cannot guarantee me the safety? We are being honest, but it's a, it's a sort of a difficult um, source, uh, way of being able to look at this. So what about intuition? So what if we looked at folks who say, well, maybe I don't need to worry. The disease, the incidence is so low that I'm very unlikely to come in contact with this disease, so maybe I don't need to vaccinate my child. If other children are immunized, herd immunity will protect my child. Well, that's true, um, and herd immunity is when most of the population is immunized, and so the, those, those infections cannot really get started in a group. And, and so that's true. However, if enough parents say, we're not going to do that, that herd immunity totally disappears. And that's what's happened in some of the uh, um, populations where we see these outbreaks. And then the other one, which I think is always very interesting, is it's natural to have these diseases. I did, and I'm fine. And that's an, an N of one. For those of you who are familiar with science, the number is one in that particular experiment. And they did fine, but a lot of other people may not. Um, but those are the, some of the ways that folks would intuitively look at risk. What about vaccine risk? Well, there's books, TV show talk hosts, news shows report possible vaccine effects. And therefore, because it's in a book or on television, it must be true because they reported it. And, um, and so that's, that's a problematic. Online chat rooms suggest that babies can't take all those shots. Maybe you've heard of that, immune overload. How can these little babies have all these shots and it, doesn't, it, it must affect them? Well, in actuality, uh, an infant's immune system is designed to deal with millions of foreign particles. And as soon as they're born and they take their first breath, guess how many antigens they're exposed to? whatever's in the air, and their immune systems do a fabulous job of responding to all of them. So a baby's immune system that is designed to respond to millions of antigens has no problems with the hundred or so that are in vaccines. And the same for the thing about aluminum. Aluminum in the vaccines is harmful. It makes perfect sense. It does. These are both very intuitive. Well, that makes sense, that aluminum vaccines is harmful. And, and in fact, the aluminum in food and breast milk is far higher than it is in vaccines. And so even though it makes sense, it's not, it's not actually proven to be so. 
And the last one, which is a very difficult one to deal with, is my sisters or my neighbors or my friend's child had a terrible reaction, so I'm not getting that from my baby. Again, it's a, it's a react, it's a one, a one anecdote, for instance. And that's not a really good way to base very important decisions. Because what we're really talking about is outcomes here. Um, what happens when people make that decision not to vaccinate their child? Um, we know that vaccines reduce infectious diseases. Even vaccine, those who are against vaccines recognize the impact and, and are very happy that their children may not be exposed. Um, science has demonstrated very few significant vaccine side effects. Now, that's one area um, that we have some, some difference of opinion. And if you look at the benefits of the vaccine, and if you scientifically weigh disease risk versus vaccine risk, it clearly is in favor of the vaccine because the side effects are minimal compared to the effects of the disease. However, if you've never seen that disease, you might say, well, I don't think that disease looks so bad, and I know that there are vaccine side effects. And so for me, intuitively, I believe that vaccine risks are higher than their benefits. So what is the outcome from that kind of thinking? Well, fewer vaccinated children mean more vaccine-preventable diseases, and more diseases means more death. And so as a pediatric infectious disease specialist, this is where it really hits the road for me, is that these kinds of decisions put children at risk for dying. These are preventable diseases. And so why is this important? Just thought I'd never seen measles before. This is a little kid with measles. Now this kid's lucky. They don't have some of the complications of measles. They're miserable, high fever, they feel terrible. But this little kid doesn't have the pneumonia that's pretty debilitating and requires hospitalizations. Doesn't have the encephalitis that can also impact their brain. But still miserable, measles kills. And we have a healthy, immunized child here who has the opportunity to not be ill from these infectious diseases and actually has the opportunity to be able to travel with greater confidence and travels a way of, of the world for us now and has an opportunity to grow up without some of the consequences of the infectious diseases. And so this is why I think this, this particular debate is really, really important. Everybody has a right to hold an opinion, and I'm the first to believe in that. However, when it puts a child at risk, that really bothers me. And I believe that science really has answers for us that should ease these fears and make it easier for us to have uh, ongoing generations of children who do not have to have these dreadful infectious diseases. And so my challenge to you is that um, science is really important, and it's being reinterpreted in many places based on intuition and not the scientific method. So I think it's really important for all of us to, and in fact critical, that the sci scientific method is understood, it's appreciated, because I really believe that this will continue to save lives, and it's what all our kids deserve. Thank you.